here at the um, Rural and Remote Scientific Rural and Remote Health Scientific Symposium in Canberra and I have um, Professor Alan Cass here from the Menzies Institute who is kindly letting me get crash his lunch to um, give us a bit of an insight into an interesting talk he gave this morning which focused on um, kidney disease dialysis and treatment issues um, among Indigenous people but also had a lot of broader implications for um, Indigenous health more generally. So if I just ask Alan first just to maybe give us some of the key messages from his talk this morning. Thanks. Um, not that it matters, but it's the Menzies School of Health Research. Oh, sorry, Menzies yeah. School of Health Research. Because <laughs> there are Menzies Institutes. Okay, I apologise. Um, doesn't matter. No, that's um, important. Um, so this morning was a wonderful opportunity to talk about kidney disease. I'm passionate about that because um, complex chronic disease and kidney disease run, runs hand in glove with diabetes, vascular disease and um, other critical issues is a predominant contributor to the gap in life expectancy and burden of illness and uh, quality of life and it has fundamental impact on how people live their lives and the burden of disease is so heavy uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, particularly in remote areas. Um, I think one telling point about kidney disease particularly is that um, our approach to that, the way we've treated kidney disease, we have required people to relocate from remote communities to access treatment. So when people have severe kidney disease and need dialysis to stay alive, they've had to move from their community in the central desert or Top End or Far North Queensland or the Kimberley or the Pilbara, sometimes hundreds or thousands of kilometres away for treatment that they need to stay alive. And so that's a very different impact. I'm not... I'm not it, it says something about how it impacts on patients, families and communities and it offers us profound challenges in terms of the health system about can we... Incredible priority for prevention and community engagement and education and sharing understandings. But are there different ways in which we need to build workforces and um, look at models of service delivery so that we can meet needs of communities which might be getting access to treatment on their country, for example, which patients have spoken so powerfully about. You can live in a community with diabetes or heart disease, and you want people to live in a community, but unfortunately, we've made people move away from community and country when they have kidney disease. So it's a profoundly important an issue. Um, in the Territory, where I live and work, Almost one in 40 Aboriginal adults are on dialysis. So there are now over 800 people who have hemodialysis three times a week. And it is uh, the most careful forecast suggests there will be over a thousand people within a few years on dialysis. So this is a remarkable burden of illness. Um, there is awareness but a profound need in primary care for a whole well, for a whole of health system approach to this um, enabling uh, primary care to do the best possible um, uh, work in identification of people with early kidney disease um, early evidence-based management understanding why people's kidney disease pro might progress so rapidly to needing dialysis rather than being more stable, letting people live in community. There's a lot to be done. Um, at the other end, Aboriginal people say it's really important to do work about for people who are on dialysis. It's not only prevention for the community, it's also about better treatment yes. because that has such an impact. And 
wherever I go throughout Australia and talk in Aboriginal communities or with Torres Strait Islander people, everyone has a family member on dialysis. Yeah. So I might talk about kidney disease at um, general community meetings and you can ask in a hall of people how many people are affected by kidney disease or have a relative and there might be a few hands but yep. whenever you talk with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community groups yep. people have a brother, a sister, a mother or father or somebody on a dialysis machine yes. um, uh, and there I think the issues are how do we listen to the patient voice about their experiences of care what is the evidence about how well the system responds to those needs? Yes. Where is the evidence of inequities in access to treatment and yep. health outcomes? And how can we carefully collect, analyse that data and make change so people have better health? Yeah. I was really interested in the, um, the comments you made this morning about... Um, the work that the Menzies School has done in in um, asking consumers and Indigenous people about their experience and how surprised you were, and you were, you know, very honest about the fact that you know you did were quite confronted by some of the results yes. that you got back, and I think that said something a bit more broadly about. Um, the um, need for healthcare providers and managers to not make assumptions about the service they're providing until they've actually heard from the consumers? Uh, very great question and comment. Um, I've been lucky over 20 years to be involved in several really important uh, and incredibly informative for me um, uh, project programs of qualitative research involving deep engagement with Aboriginal patients, families and communities about living with kidney and chronic disease, their experiences and really trying to understand critical things about how we deliver care. I talked this morning, the first project I was involved in was called Sharing the True Stories, um, where this was participatory action research where the research team included people like me, kidney specialists, nurses, educators and our patients and their community members, linguists, our people working closely with communities and we um, filmed, was videotaping them, but uh, we, we filmed clinical interactions that were occurring in the renal service or in community uh, and we iteratively <coughs> analysed how well we were communicating. So, mm -hmm. so we chose a number of key interactions in the dialysis unit in Darwin, out in community, doctors and nurses, educators talking with patients. And we then used this careful process where they would film the interaction, so a normal interaction, and then they would interview both the care provider and patient in their own first language about the interaction, what were the key issues they wanted to communicate about, how effective did they think was the communication, um, you know, did they think there were issues that they, for example, as a patient, were trying to talk about that they felt the doctor or nurse had failed to understand. Um, and through that careful process of talking immediately about what you'd done and then coming back and, you know, they would come back and show you the film and say, you told us you were saying this about um, what the patient, you know, in my case, was, was drinking and um, how that would affect her health. But she said that she understood it in a different way and what might that mean? And I think through doing that careful participatory action research where we sort of, it was almost like, you know, getting deeper through the skin of an onion to, to the core of what were the, the issues, um, that we came to conclude that miscommunication was pervasive, that often it was not recognised, and that it was about the most fundamental issues of healthcare. So there were issues which I 
talked about where um, people with kidney disease who are on dialysis and have had prolonged hospital admissions, you know, a young man in community who thought his kidney disease had been cured, whereas the reality was that he had now severe incurable kidney disease that needed to be managed and treated um, but where we had not been able to communicate that most fundamental issue that he had been unwell and certain emergency treatments had been provided but then to prepare for that ongoing discussion about what he needed for his health and in my case um, it was a really important communication about fluid restriction, which people need to follow a strict fluid restriction with kidney disease, because the kidneys no longer pass urine yep. uh, when they fail, and you need the dialysis machine to take that fluid off so yep. they can breathe. Okay. Um, uh, and we were talking about a critical issue of um, that, that uh, young person's, um, how much fluid she was drinking, and, and there it was fascinating that I thought in that interaction we had clearly talked through the issue and solved it and that she understood from talking to me what was fundamentally important about restricting her fluid intake that this would keep her healthy rather than coming to the emergency department extremely ill often. Um, but there were deeper issues at play that I was totally unaware of. Um, issues about the power of the relationship me being the health professional yeah. sitting in a room talking to this actually highly educated but young mm. Aboriginal woman with kidney disease yeah. who attempted to diffuse uh, what might be potential conflict in a discussion about um, uh, where I might have been pressing her about issues of how much she was drinking and yeah. things yeah. that in that in a situation where there was anxiety, she would answer some questions by saying, yo, yo, which I took to be yes, yes, yes. that she understood. Yeah. But, but it was, you know, something that through the research I became more aware that in a cross-cultural setting where the health professionals are, you know, often empowered and a patient might feel disempowered and not in control of an interaction that they might react that way to diffuse yeah. um, that you know anxiety or um, so what would that have meant that person would have come to the emergency department again the next day because yeah. I had in fact totally failed to communicate about those issues yeah. um, so for me that was fundamentally important research because it uncovered the extent of miscommunication and this, you often see reports where people talk about people presenting to a hospital of one off who might have a heart attack, for example. Yeah. And you understand how confronting that might be. But this is very different. These are people who come three times a week for dialysis. Mm. So, to some degree, they're familiar with the environment. Yeah. They know the staff. They have good and strong relationships, in this case, with many of the staff. But even then, fundamental miscommunication was occurring. And that led to changes in the way uh, meetings that discussed education needs of patients were structured. So an idea that rather, rather than a one-on-one -on -one doctor sits with patient, deals with issues that there were settings where patients might come together and have common issues that they want to engage with doctors, nurses and educators about yeah. and have, uh, we're, we're now in the top end, have yarning circles, which yeah. Dr Jackie Hughes, who's a, the only um, Indigenous kidney specialist in the country who works yeah. at Menzies and Royal Darwin Hospital, um, you know, where she and others are very much trying to structure an environment where groups of patients can identify critical issues that they want more information about yeah. and have an environment where we can talk through those issues in ways where they feel empowered and able to ask questions and get the answers they need. Yeah. So I thought that... And that's followed through other research, the impact research where we interviewed 140 Aboriginal patients and Torres Strait Islander patients around the country about 
their experiences and where they again highlighted difficulties in getting information they needed, yes. barriers to engagement with nursing and medical staff, uh, and where we asked them about that issue of um, where those assumptions are often made that they might prefer certain forms of treatment above others yes. Yes. Uh, based on not good evidence, based on what might be stereotypical views of yes. what yes. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients might want or like. Um, and so one issue was exploring were they interested in kidney transplantation? What did they understand about that? Did they see that as a form of treatment that might be of benefit to them? Yes. Um, because I think the assumption that is often made is that there are cultural barriers to Aboriginal people accepting transplants yes. and that um, they might be afraid of a transplant and not want one and be happy continuing on dialysis. Yes. And that research clearly showed that that was not the case. Aboriginal patients and Torres Strait Islander patients were intensely interested in kidney transplantation. They wanted to understand what were the processes uh, for decision making about who was suitable, what tests might they need to have, how did they get the best information, uh, and they talked about how they made decisions as an individual and within their families, yeah. and they acknowledged cultural sensitivities but talked very clearly to their own um, agency as the individual who had health problems yes. to make decisions yes. that they felt best um, reflected their own interests about staying well and yes. being healthy. Um, so I thought that was really fundamentally important because we should not and can't make assumptions about what individuals or groups might think about treatments, where they want treatment, how they want treatment, different treatments, we need to ask people and understand their views and understand and help them to make the best decisions. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and um, one statistic that really stood out to me in your talk was that Indigenous people had something like, I think you said a one in five or six um, chance of receiving a kidney transplant compared to non-Indigenous people and this was not an issue of rurality, so Indigenous people, regardless of where they live, um, still have a much lower chance of getting a transplant compared with non-Indigenous people, regardless of, of where they live. That is correct. Um, so in September of last year, 2017, uh, we uh, uh, held an Indigenous Patient Voices Symposium where um, about 60 patients, people with kidney disease and their carers and other people from the community came together for a whole day at our National Kidney Disease Symposium, the annual, annual yeah. meeting, and they talked about what were the key uh, issues that they felt should be addressed about um, getting access to care as they wanted. And they talked clearly about getting treatment on country mm -hmm. and that both, when we've talked to people, is about are there models of giving people dialysis which can be provided safely and appropriately on country, and yeah. there are, yeah. and there, that is challenging and there are barriers to doing that, that uh, health services and governments need to address. Yeah. But the other one is indeed transplantation. That. Yeah. Um, and in that research I talked about earlier, patients saw transplant as one way of getting back to much more normal health and being able to get home to their country and their family. Um, transplant access, um, there are each year, unfortunately, an ever-increasing number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on dialysis with severe kidney disease. Um, the for adults of the best from age 18 to 65 who are in the age group where people are not often actively considered for transplantation 
Aboriginal people continue to have poor access to transplantation. Um, yes, uh, probably a one in four to one in five uh, as likely chance of receiving a transplant. That is correct. Um, there are many, many barriers to transplantation that we need to think through, understand and address. Yep. I would never say, I, I have seen no evidence, um, and I've talked with providers, patients and service, you know, across the country of uh, racism amongst providers. Yep. But what is critical is how does the system work to enable people to get the best care. And that's where multiple issues in terms of system performance add up so that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have inequitable access to treatment. Yes. So what does that mean? That means things like you might need um, careful testing to look at your cardiac function, to uh, check for uh, a range of infections. You can't give someone a transplant and immune drugs to stop them rejecting it if you cause overwhelming infection. Yep. So there are a series of tests that need to be done to check it is safe for an individual yep. to have a transplant. They may take months and months and months in remote areas, yes. whereas if you're a patient in Sydney, um, you might be able to coordinate all of that very quickly. Yes. Um, yes. So <coughs> through our research, we have at times um, found very practical issues that, that cause real yes. blockages, yes. like if you're in an area where people can't get access to a public dentist, yes. which can happen yeah, in absolutely. rural and regional <laughs> areas, and many patients have a significant number of decayed teeth that need to be pulled out, yes. you can't be put on a transplant waiting no. list while you have eight decayed teeth yes. that a dentist yes. needs to pull out. Yes. So you cannot get a transplant. Yeah. So yes. if you are in a regional town or somewhere where you can't get access to a dentist, yes. you won't get a transplant until no. that's fixed. Okay. Um, then there are those key processes of engagement and education working together with the service providers, yes. where the research, when it has talked about people feeling they don't best know how to access the information they need, yes. that's a barrier. Yes. That's where yes. some of those initiatives like the yarning circles are so important. Yes. So yes. I've been, I remember a yarning circle in Central Australia where we held it on two days running so that people who were on dialysis Monday, Wednesday and Friday could come oh, and yeah. Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. <laughs> yep. And we had on the two days almost 200 wow. Aboriginal patients come wow. and ask about, yes. can I get a transplant? Yes. What yes. happens? What are the processes? What mm -hmm. do I need to do? Mm -hmm. Who can I talk to about it? Yes. Um, yes. So again, I think those initiatives are critical. Yeah. The other issues that I think become crucial are um, how do we make decisions about uh, organs for transplantation are a scarce resource. Sure. There is There are national initiatives to increase mm -hmm. and there have, has been success in recent years. Mm -hmm. Still, the numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients receiving kidney transplants has not no. increased, um, I think, sufficient to those who might benefit. Yeah. Um, and how do we make decisions about the balance between equity issues mm -hmm. and maximal utility of yes. a scarce resource? Yes. Yes. I, I believe... It, Research that I've been involved in suggests that the Australian population generally support a, an approach based on need and equity. Yes. Um, that where people have a significant need for a treatment yeah. and might benefit from that, mm. that uh, the people you know in most pressing need uh, should be prioritised. Mm. I, don't, I don't think they are as interested in what might be notions about how likely are you to live for nine years after a transplant, if sure. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, it's critical that we talk to people about how do you value 
life, what makes for a good life when you have kidney disease? Yes. Yes. Particularly Aboriginal patients, yes. Yes. where the ability to live a life on country or with family is so important. Yeah. And last but not least, we want to make sure that the treatments you give don't harm people and give them benefit as an yes. individual. Yes. And that's where some recent research trying to show, trying to look at, is there a survival benefit for Aboriginal people receiving kidney transplants? Um, I think as we do that more and more carefully, trying to compare, the important comparison is not how do Aboriginal people as a group do compared to non-Aboriginal people, yep. but do you have a benefit in having a transplant compared to a best matched person who stays on dialysis? Yep. And there I think the emerging research, some of which will be presented this year, yep is beginning to clarify that for Aboriginal as well as non-Aboriginal people there is a survival benefit from transplantation. You need to work closely with patients, maximise, you know, choose, work with people who have the maximal chance of doing well and getting good outcomes with yeah. treatment, yeah. but I think the evidence will show that there are more people who would be suitable who we should work towards our system enabling them getting access to transplantation. Um, and I think that important again that we don't make assumptions about how a group or an individual might, what they might understand, what they might want or how they might benefit from a treatment, that we do the research to look at, the, to give the best evidence to inform those mm -hmm. discussions, yep. and that we, um, we talk genuinely and carefully with people so they can talk about their treatment wishes and what, what meets their needs. Okay, now that's, that's great. Some really, really important learnings there, both for addressing the burden of um, kidney disease within Indigenous populations, but also more broadly for dealing with um, Indigenous people or indeed any cultural or diverse language group um, in improving their health care. Thank you, Alan Cass. No problem. Sorry if I talk too much.